Welcome to scarcity. <laughs> I've written a lot on this subject this week um, because I think it is as important and as complex, at least, as boundaries. Um, because both boundaries and scarcity are about how we take that emotionally ho sober home space and navigate the world uh, outside of us, so to speak. And I think the way that we best can do that is to not think of it really as the world outside of us, but to stay in intimate relationship with it. I think it's when we start to think of the world as outside of us that we start to believe in the toxic fiction of scarcity. When we stay in that intimate connection with all that is, it's hard to imagine that we ever believed in scarcity. There is so much available to us at every moment, and we are partaking of so much at every moment, with every breath, with every beat of our heart. We are in and of the world all intimately and we can try to resist that but that's false and that particular fiction generates so much suffering maybe all the suffering actually separation brings suffering and that suffering is false i mean the sensations are true that we really have the sensations like of suffering and clenching and scarcity in our bodies they really arise, that's for sure. And we really bring them to the interactions that we have in the world. That part is true. But the generator of those thoughts is of our own making. And the sooner we can take responsibility for that, for where we want to step onto a position in the victim triangle, where we want to be a victim, where do we want to be a perpetrator just to feel that we have some sense of agency in a, in a momentously overwhelming world full of so much uncertainty. I mean, we can be in perpetrator and shake our fists at that overwhelm. Or we can come back into that breath, realize our intimacy with all that is, and let go of that let go of it completely. It really is optional. I mean, it is possible not to have enough money to eat. I've been in that situation. I can do a lot of things with lentils. <laughs> it's always changing. That situation was already changing for me. And what changed it? What changed it was actually letting go of my belief in the story of scarcity. The only time I didn't have enough money for food was when I was working a full-time job. Take that to your pillow mother. Part of that job involved me believing that that was the best I could hope for, and that was where I needed to be. And that's just the way the world was. I would ask you to check in with yourself when you think, well, that's just the way the world is. That's just reality. What a shitty world. What a tough world. What a horrible situation we're in. And we're in a challenging situation, all of us right now. There's a big old mirror being held up to us. What are, what are we going to see in it? We can see the mental projections that we've been fed our entire lives. We can choose to see that. We can choose to look in that mirror and say, I'm too flabby, I'm too old, I'm too fat, I'm too thin, I'm too broke, I'm too uh, 
whatever dumb bullshit. Or you can look at it and see the tree behind you. Like I can see a tree in front of me and the blue sky and the neighbor across the street who loves Trump. And I can just love all that and know that we share the same air all the time with just about every breath. So I'm part of him and he's part of me. And if I pretend otherwise, I will only suffer and bring suffering to others. I mean, this is why when things come up in the calls or in the group around victim consciousness, my intention is never victim blaming. I understand that terrible things happen. I've experienced plenty of them myself. I understand that. And I have deep compassion for that. There came a time for me anyway, when I had to allow myself to be broken open by that, instead of to doubling down around the point of impact and clenching on it and saying, you can't touch me there because I'm hurt there. Yes, I was hurt there. Hurt so much that I had to stay with that spot, that tender spot so long and so quietly and with such total stillness that it opened up again. And everything that I had clenched around it came out. And that wasn't pretty, and that wasn't comfortable, but it was part of my association with scarcity. What do I not have enough of today? What did I not have enough of when I was a baby? What did I not have enough of when I was three or five or seven or 10 or 20 or 30? What did I get so used to not having enough of that I stopped believing I could ever have it? And is that so? Is that so? I mean, what is so for me today is that I have absolutely enough. I am enough. I have enough. I feel wildly lucky. And are my external circumstances very different from what they were a year ago or even three years ago when I was sad as fuck? No, the external circumstances aren't wildly different. The internal circumstances are. And all of that All of that. Yeah, is that an underestimation? No, that is not an overestimation. All of that is connected to my relationship to scarcity. What is my level of buy-in around scarcity? Do I consent to scarcity or do I not consent to scarcity? Because once once I am certain in myself, as certain as certain can be, and I think the only things we can have any kind of certainty about are the things that we are willing to let go of. Am I willing to let go of that? Mm, I certainly am. So as I released the stories about scarcity and where they lived in my body, where are all those old things that I didn't have enough of or when I didn't feel like I was enough to get the thing that I wanted or if I were better I would get this thing you know and that starts to internalize this story of incompleteness and that somehow I mean we're all flawed and perfect none of us are so flawed that we cannot be loved starting right inside of our own hearts 
once I let go of those stories little by little and saw that some of them were very, very old and some of them were so old that they weren't even mine. Some of them have been carried through generations of my family to me. And that's doing more and more reading about epigenetics. And there's, that's not just woo. That's actually true. The stories that our ancestors told themselves about who they were get passed along and they actually shape physically who we are. And I can see that even in my own, my own physical appearance, how my body looks, how, how my face looks, how, how the way I look has changed over the years in subtle and obvious ways according to what I hold on to. When I was still deep in sexual trauma, I had so much extra weight on me. It, it was insulation, it was protection. It was protection from being looked at, protection from being seen, protection from having to be in a position to be seen. And how did I get to the core of that trauma? Was often in sit sitting in meditation and doing a scan of my body. My eyes closed just down. Where is their sensation? Where is their pain? And sometimes the greatest clue is where do I feel nothing at all? Where am I numb? And those were the places that I had to send the most loving energy to, the most melting warmth. I think sometimes part of it is just giving yourself permission to let it go. I don't have to hold on to this idea about scarcity. I don't have to hold on to this concept where I'm not enough or this idea that not having enough is somehow noble. One of the things that I haven't been writing about this week, which is I think the thing that people uh, come to most, and I know was a big issue for me in thinking about scarcity and feeling into scarcity is money. And what I feel like I've discovered about scarcity in my practice is that if I address scarcity of patience, scarcity of time, scarcity of energy, then the scarcity of money piece becomes, um, its root becomes more obvious. So then I can come, what is my relationship to money? I mean, I grew up believing that poor was noble, that rich people were assholes, you know? And why do I carry that? And what is the legacy of that in terms of how I allow myself to show up in the world? Do I hold back because, oh, I don't, I don't want you to see me in my fullness. Because that might mean too much of something or, or I might be too much. That's something I've heard of, heard so much in my life, which is in itself um, a sort of, uh, version of scarcity that people would like to put on you when you don't uh, when you don't necessarily consent to scarcity when you show up completely as you are people are very happy to say oh she's too much or that's oh I, I had I had um, this ex-fiance one time <laughs> who when he when he thought I was being too exuberant would tap me on the knee and then downshift as if I were a car, because he was not comfortable with how I was, right? So the more people that are around you that themselves believe in scarcity, the more resistance you will get to shedding it. And I'm not saying even that you let those relationships go, because to me, the more you show up in your fullness as the emotionally sober, powerful person that you are, the more 
your example will free them to let go of their own scarcity. And that's far better than pulling back or ending that relationship. But then there are some people who truly don't wish to be better, that are very tied into an identity of this is who I am, this is who I'm going to be, and I'm not interested in changing that. And how, how I approach those relationships, the ones that I choose to remain in, is with so much love and kindness. I send people who are in that space more love and kindness than the people who are suffering, but suffering openly and willingly knowing that no feeling is final. Because the people that won't show up for the whole enchilada will suffer so much longer and so much more irreparably. And when I was in my mid-30s, I spent some time as a hospice volunteer. And I often think about that, you know, that training and that work and, and how the people who don't want to change today, who don't wish to um, be uncomfortable, like, it doesn't go away. It will find you eventually. <laughs> And I'm so grateful that I had the chance to do that work when I was still pretty young because it really did shift how I approached relationships and um, how I looked at my how I looked at my sense of openness and my willingness to show up. And now Again, I would reiterate, when you are willing to show up in your wholeness, you will still get a lot of resistance. Scarcity runs this place. And if you don't consent to it, you will get some pushback. And so for me, that, that, those early attempts to show up in my fullness, like this is who I am, I'm going to show up in the world this way, got so much pushback that I didn't want to show up anymore. I wanted to disappear completely. I wanted, I actually wanted to die. So I completely retreated. And I mean, I, my dark night of the soul lasted eight years. <laughs> so what I'm telling you about these things about um, victimhood and about the drama triangle and about boundaries about scarcity and self-compassion. I'm not telling you these things because I read them in a book, though I have done that as a follow-up. But these are the fires that I have crawled through. So I bring you this not so much as a lesson, as much as it is a plea. And... Um, and an encouragement. I was thinking of what really sums up where I'm at right now and what is the, someone asked me like what is like what is the best the best advice I would have to offer and it's really that line from Rilke no feeling is final. For me once I understood that in my bones my spiritual metabolism, my emotional spiritual metabolism became so strong and so agile that I could welcome and can welcome anything with open arms. I truly trust that above all else, no feeling is final. It's like the one true thing. I know that can be hard when things feel scarce. The clench of scarcity is such a culturally sanctioned clench. 
everyone agrees. If you don't have enough money, you should clinch. If you don't have this thing or that, I mean, for, for me, it, um, I, I didn't get married. I didn't have kids. So, you know, you have those like going home for Christmas things where everybody's like, oh, oh. <laughs> and so that's sort of what I'm getting at is like pe people will be very happy if you, if your choices do not match up with theirs for them to give you some level of resistance or disapproval or to put you in some kind of discomfort about where you are. And just go with it. That's okay. If that's uncomfortable, that's okay. Like for me, I had to really check in because my reaction to that discomfort would be like, well, I don't know, frankly, your marriage and your kids don't look so fucking hot. <laughs> so like I had to just like, feel that surge of like, how dare you? And let that run through me and be like, oh, well, you know, I don't know what that person's going through. I don't know how difficult their morning was with their spouse. And maybe they have a little resentment toward the fact that I'll have to deal with that, those kinds of things in my life that I have other things to deal with. I mean, that that's the thing too. We're, we all get our measure of suffering, no matter what choices we make. We all get our portion of conflict and resistance and uh, desires not being met. But can we then in that situation, does that have to be suffering? Or can we revisit that desire, ground it back in the body? and let it let the energy of that desire permeate us run through us be in the world without an object can we just embody the desire of something without needing to hook it into anything can we let energy be without pushing pulling or putting it anywhere If we feel like we have some scarce gap inside of us, can we be like, oh, look at that. Look at that giant hole inside me. <laughs> and instead of trying to stuff somebody or some food or some booze or some whatever into the hole, can we just be like, wow, that thing is vast. thing is vast. Look how the whole world moves right through it. That thing is vast. We are each one of us vast and tiny things. Just here but for a minute. Not scarce, tiny, tiny and vast. And our spiritual and emotional metabolism can allow us a joyful agility to move between that tininess and that vastness and to walk right in the middle of that tininess and that vastness and that embodiment and that penetrability with all that is. That's the middle way. That's the middle way. Just allow ourselves to be between the tiny and the vast. There's so much freedom there. There's all the freedom there. The real freedom. Not the freedom to be a selfish asshole. Not the freedom to not give a shit about the people next to you. That's not freedom. That's scarcity. I'm talking about heartfelt 
permeable freedom. The freedom to understand in your, in your pussy, your heart, and your mind that not knowing is most intimate. That not knowing is most free. Your, your willingness to not know that's really the only banner under which freedom flies, you know? It's not a nation state. It's in each one of our bodies. Happy Sunday.